Welcome everyone to Meditation for Lawyers. I'm George Philos. I will be um, with you this next hour. Um, this, by the way, is not, hold on. This is not mediation for lawyers. So if we have anyone signing up thinking that they're going to learn how to mediate today, um, sorry, but you're still welcome. I hope you stay with us for the next uh, hour. And this is also not medication for lawyers. And believe it or not, yes, I have had um, uh, a number of, um, a small number, maybe one or two, um, sign up thinking that some drugs would be dispensed uh, today. But no, this is not uh, medication for lawyers, um, although meditation is known to maybe produce a little extra, uh, uh, extra endorphins uh, along the way. Okay, so I want to first um, thank you for attending and thank you to our friends uh, from Oregon, uh, from California and Pennsylvania uh, as well uh, for joining us, uh, Floridians, uh, today. Um, we've got a little brush of autumn today um, and I hope our uh, here it's cold in Pennsylvania I hope our friends there don't think we're being a little snarky as us Floridians tend to do about our weather in the winter. Um, I also want to thank uh, Will Nickel my um, uh, technical advisor and uh, assistant if there's anything that uh, needs to be attended to on the technical side um, just mention that in the chat and uh, we will be in contact with you. So, our goal this morning is for you to relax and enjoy yourself and um, also to learn how to meditate in the sense that after taking this one hour webinar, um, you will have learned enough and experienced uh, enough to um, start your own meditation practice. Because although I hope you'll get a benefit uh, today and enjoy today, um, you know, we wish for you the long-term benefits of uh, meditation. So we hope that this is a, a catalyst for you to start your own meditation practice. Um, I'm curious, Will, perhaps you could do a little survey and um, ask the participants how many of them um, already meditate um, and, or ask it another way, is it the first time for anyone uh, today meditating? So, um, yes, we have a poll. Hey everyone, we, this is Will. Mm -hmm. uh, we have three first timers for mm -hmm. meditating today and we have two that have replied, I don't know, and um, 26 that have meditated before. Okay, okay, great. Well, to the, to the two, uh, haven'ts and the two I don't knows. I want to assure you that we've been doing this for two years now and um, no blood has been shed. Um, and I mentioned that I mentioned that because to many meditation, um, just the word is a little intimidating. And I've met a lot of people who say, gee, I'd really like to meditate. My friends meditate. I, I've noticed the, the benefits of meditation, but my mind is just so active or there's no way, you know, I could do that. And so I just want to assure you that this is easy. It is simple in a way and anyone can meditate. The only, the only thing that you need, the only prerequisite you have to meditate is having an interest in it. That's it. If you have an interest in meditation, then you'll be able to uh, meditate. Um, I want to mention uh, a couple things about thoughts and um, how that's an obstacle or people perceive that as an obstacle to being uh, to, to meditation. I once gave a, a talk at a, uh, I gave a lecture about meditation and in the lobby afterwards, um, a woman came up to me and she was, she had tears in her eyes and said, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, and I said, 
yeah, you're welcome, but why in particular? And she said, when you told me that meditation has nothing to do with stopping your thoughts or stopping your mind, I, I just, I felt so relieved because I thought if that's the task, then I'll never be able to do that. So, and many people believe that. So if you think meditation is about stopping the mind, you're in then for um, a very frustrating experience. Um, and that's not the purpose. And let me explain it just briefly. I like this uh, analogy. Meditation is just a slight shift in focus. And we can use the analogy of a painting that has a foreground and a background. And usually it's the, fore the, the objects in the foreground that capture our uh, attention because they're, they're right in front of us. In meditation, what we're doing is paying a little bit more attention or moving our focus a little bit from the foreground to the background. And to continue that analogy, if you're looking at a painting, to look at the foreground, you just change your focus a little bit and look at what's behind. But the important thing is you don't eradicate what's in the foreground. You don't have to paint over the objects in the foreground to be able to notice the background. It's just a slight shift in attention and focus. So what we're doing here, and it's good to remember in meditating, is that we're not trying to get rid of, of anything. We're just taking a slightly different look at things. Now, a couple, a couple practicalities. Um, we have a, this is a one hour webcast, and I'm going to set aside um, 10 minutes at the end for questions. And if the, if there are more questions than time permits, fine, we'll stay on. You don't have to, you're free to leave. And well, you're free to leave anytime, obviously. Um, but you can leave after the hour, you still get your CLE credit. Um, and we'll just stay on uh, to answer all the questions if you'd like to, if that happens and you'd like to st uh, stay on over time. You can see and hear me. I can't see and I can't see and hear you unless you wish to be seen or heard. So you can, and the attendees cannot see and hear each other. So again, technical questions in the chat room. For written questions, we have a question and answer icon uh, on the bottom, a Q&A icon. Um, if someone would like to, um, if someone would like to um, ask a question um, uh, by voice, um, we have, Will, refresh my recollection. What button do they push for that? They can raise their hand in uh, the attendee box. Yes, okay, thank you. You can raise your, you can raise your hand in the attendee box and um, you can ask your question either uh, simply by voice or if you wanna be seen, Will can put you on a split screen and, and we'll, uh, we're happy to have you share the screen and asking your question. About the, about the questions, um, if you're going to write down your questions or formulate them, um, my advice is don't do it. Don't do it during the meditative experiences. We're going to have about four or five five-minute meditation segments. So don't worry that oh, we're going to be sitting for 30, 40 minutes. And in those in those segments, I'll be giving some uh, some instruction. So if you have questions. Don't divert your attention from the session, kind of jot them down uh, later if you can. And for the most part, um, if something presses, pressing comes up, we can answer it um, between sessions, or if not, we'll just pick them up at the, uh, at the end. Um, now, this is for um, CLE credit in Florida and Oregon. And so we'll give you the respective course numbers. We'll email them to you after the course. And also within a day or two, we'll email you a recording um, uh, for your use. Now, as far as the place, if you're in, it's best to do this in a quiet and undistracted place. So if you're at your office, um, ask your assistant to please hold uh, your calls. Um, 
if you decided to, it's lunchtime here on the East Coast, if you decided to eat lunch or eat breakfast on the West Coast, um, my advice is don't distract yourself with that. You can wait an hour and uh, have your meal uh, a little bit uh, a little bit later. Uh, turn off your cell phone, have your uh, calls uh, held. Now, as far as the meditation posture, we'll call this the outer posture. Um, you can meditate in any position. I would recommend sitting. You can meditate lying down. It's just our our, our bodies so associate lying down with sleep. It's much easier to nod off. So. Um, sit uh, in a comfortable position. It, ha it helps to have your uh, uh, spine uh, erect. And again, that's not to kind of uh, prevent dozing off and sleeping. Um, also, your, uh, I would suggest you have your eyes closed. You can have your eyes open, but I suggest closing your eyes in order to um, minimize outer uh, distractions. And what you want here is a relaxed attention. And the analogy I like to use is a camera. If you're focusing a camera, you have that sweet spot where it's in focus. And you can underfocus, and in meditation, underfocus is becoming lethargic, tired. Overfocus is being hyper attentive and a little wiry. Um, and so you're looking for that sweet spot of being attentive, but uh, relaxed. Um, just very briefly, you're here because you, you're aware of the benefits of meditation. I'll say that for me in a very um, highly stressed litigation practice, my specialty was litigating right to die cases, the Terry Schiavo case. I mean, we had, we had, we would have a brief, we would have an appeal filed in the uh, federal circuit and get a briefing schedule of um, initial brief at noon, answer brief at 8 p.m., reply brief at midnight. <laughs> and we had those for days after days. I mean, we all, have, we all have these stressors. What I'm saying is having something in available to you at the time was an, is a great benefit. It was a great benefit for me. There's an old saying, you don't start to dig the well when the house is on fire. So whatever those stressors we have in, in practice in life, to have a practice that works for you that you can go to um, is, is very helpful. Last thing before we dive into our first meditation is this is about your direct experience. It's not about what I tell you or what anyone else has tell, told you or what you've heard or what you, or what you believe. Be like a scientist, be open to the facts. Kind of just observe, observe what's happening and reach your uh, own conclusions about meditation and, uh, and your experience. Um, this is the time that you've dedicated for yourself. So make, you know, make the most of it and trust yourself and your experience. So first thing we're going to do is a little body, body centering. Um, just kind of relax, unwind a little bit. So get comfortable in your Get comfortable in your chair. Close your eyes. And immediately just feel the flood of sensations. You might feel the heart beating, the feeling of the soles of your feet against the floor. There may be areas in the body that are a little tense, some are more relaxed than others. There's nothing to do here. You have no you know, you have no job just to notice, other than to notice.
There's nothing to change, nothing to alter. And center your attention for a moment on the sensation of the soles of your feet against the floor. You may notice it pulsates. It's more concentrated in one area than another. You may notice that, that the sensation's not static. It's always morphing, changing in subtle ways, in major ways. Now notice the back of your palms, the back of your hands. Notice the sensation of the air touching the skin on the back of your hands. Is it cool? Is it warm? Again, there's nothing to do, just notice that. Now you may hear a sound. It could be a car outside, the air conditioning or heating system, Just let it float by. Again, nothing to do. Nothing to change. Feel the weight of the body pressing down upon the seat on your chair. Notice too, that there is no effort in awareness. There's nothing you need to do to be aware of that sensation of the weight of the body on the seat. You just see it. You don't have to make it happen. Now take a moment to notice your breath. It may be slower or faster. It doesn't make a difference. The breath may appear as the sensation of the abdomen rising and falling as your diaphragm pushes in and out. It may be the sensation of the air touching the tip of the nostrils as it enters or exits. Just allow your breath to be as it is. Allow your body to be as it is. And then slowly open your eyes.
so that's an example of just spending, we spent five minutes, that's all. Five minutes in a simple, you can call it body awareness meditation. But notice how much more relaxed you may feel. You may not feel, but many, many may. Just by sitting for a few minutes and, and noticing. So, in deciding to teach meditation for lawyers, I said to myself, what's the focus? Why are we doing that? What are we most interested in? And the word that came The word that came up to me is authenticity. We like authenticity, don't we? We value it. We can recognize it in others. We can recognize it in ourselves and we are intimately familiar with our own inauthenticity. We know if we're being fed a line, and most of the times we know if we're feeding ourselves a line. Uh, if you've done jury work, I've always been impressed by the collective wisdom of juries. Um, I think they see through, um, uh, they see through inauthenticity. Um, I'm not saying you can't, a jury's never been snookered, maybe they have, but I've been impressed by their collective authenticity. There's something about authenticity that speaks of the truth. Someone who's authentic is being who you are. It's kind of your default position of who you are, what you are. And the benefit of being who you are is that there's a relaxation and a relief in being who you are. You don't have to do anything to be yourself. You can't, you can't lose yourself. And you don't have to fake or pretend. And so if you're faking or pretending, then you're engaged in pretense, which I like to call um, the precursor to, uh, to tension because, or the preamble to tension. Because when we're involved in pretense, we have to expend more energy to be what we're not. And in, and in addition to expending more energy, there's an anxiety associated with pretense because, oh, what if I'm, dis <laughs> what if I'm discovered I'm really not what I'm pretending uh, to be? You know, that's not to say we don't play different roles. We're fathers and mothers and attorneys and judges and um, citizens. And I mean, we, we have many different roles. Um, and it's not that you can't authentically play those roles. But if you're involved in pretense, you tend to identify the, in those roles and become what you're playing and believe that you are the role you're playing. And that is takes a tremendous amount of energy and produces a lot of um, anxiety. So in, in our society, being who you are has been recognized in many, uh, in many ways. And hold on, excuse me, a technical problem. In Hamlet, Polonius said to Laertes, to thy own self be true. And in the current vernacular, it's the phrase is get real when some when someone's a little too puffed up or inauthentic, they're said and they're told to get real. Well, what is what is real? What is that authentic part of ourself? And I'm just going to throw out a couple of definitions. One is reality or that which is real is that which cannot not exist. Or said another way, that which doesn't change. 
So in our next meditation, and that's what we're kind of interested here in this meditation, is there anything at our core, at our root, that is changeless and doesn't change? And um, in this next meditation, we are going to explore what does change and what we're intimately familiar with. And that is bodily sensations, what we were exploring in the first meditation, sense perceptions, what we hear, what we see, uh, what we feel, what we smell, and, uh, and our thoughts. So those are changing all the time and we're gonna take a look at that in this next meditation. So again, sit in a comfortable position. If you need to stretch a little bit, that's fine. We've been sitting now for almost a half hour. Close your eyes. Sink into the chair. Keep your spine straight. You may again feel the feet against the floor. That's a sense perception. Excuse me, that's a bodily, bodily perception, bodily sensation. You may hear a sound. That sound is the sense perception. You may have the thought, what the heck am I doing here doing this? That's just a thought. Just take a moment and see if you can kind of distinguish between the three types of objects that are in the field of notice or on the playing field. It's only three. What you're experiencing is either a thought, a bodily sensation, or a sense perception. If you had a thought, oh my God, I have to get that pleading out this afternoon. It's just a thought. If you have a little tightness in your neck that you feel it's a bodily sensation, just let them float. Let them be unanchored. Again, we're not trying to manipulate anything. We're not trying to change anything. We're not trying to create an experience. All you're doing is noticing, which you naturally and effortlessly do. The sound of my voice, sense perception. So, the nature of these objects is to arise, be in our field of view, and then disappear. Your thought doesn't stay forever, neither does a bodily sensation or a sense perception. They're always changing, always moving. Now your mind, these objects may be so rapid or they may be so attention grabbing that you're just kind of taken away 
by one and yet another. Just kind of imagine that you are, you are the sky and these objects are clouds in the sky. They morph, they change form, they come, they go. But the sky is left unperturbed. Some of these may be intense. Some of those objects may have, may be intense. So just imagine they're like fireworks, fireworks exploding in the night sky. You have a thought, oh my God, what am I gonna do about that? It's kind of explodes, grabs your attention. But you're the night sky, no matter how intense the explosion of the fireworks, it's bright, it dissipates, it fades away. Just sink back, if you will, and let these thoughts and bodily sensations and sense perceptions arise and pass away. One thing that's guaranteed, once they arise, they're not here to stay. Imagine that you're, you're the water in a fish tank and little fish are darting and swimming away swimming all around. In a way you are the medium or the background upon which these objects appear and move and disappear. And just take a few more moments. And slowly open your eyes. So what we're interested in exploring in particular is that in which or upon which all those objects arise, appear, and disappear. And we know that there is something greater than those objects because did any of you cease to exist in between thoughts or in between bodily sensations or sense perceptions? You know, there's a little space in between each one in that and those successions. Or if in, in any time, if you're not, if there's not an object, a thought, a perception in your field of view, do you, do you cease to exist during that time? Of course not. There's something, there's something that continues to exist. There's something that's real. And for purposes of our sharing today, we're going to we're gonna give it a name and we will call it awareness. Um, and people, different people give it different names, um, source, being, presence, but that's what we're interested in, that, that awareness, um, that part of ourselves that seems to be different in, in terms of the objects that appear within it, that awareness, that source being not transient or not changing. So we're going to, we're going to explore that awareness and you might say, well, okay, how are we gonna do it? Well, there are two ways I think to best 
explore that. And one is a posture of non-interference. And we've talked about that in all the meditations, just letting things unfold and not interfering, trying to change. Now, what forms does interference come in? Um, oops. There's one type of interference is judgment. I'm not doing this meditation as good as I might, or, um, or, wow, I'm really getting it. You know, this judgment or comment upon your experience is a type of interference. It generates more thoughts, more, more comments. So all you need to do is notice it. Don't judge the judgment. Don't comment upon the comment. The judgment or comment is just a thought, another thought that passes that passes along. Other types of interference is like or dislike. Ooh, I like that thought. I like, ooh, I like that sensation. That sensation's pleasurable. That one's, uh, I don't care about that one. That one is, is painful. Like, dislike, past, future. All of those lights a fire under the creation of object <laughs> um, burner let's say. Um, so that interference just generates more in the way of objects. And all we have to do is if we, all we, all you have to do is notice it. And if you notice it and you have the intention not to interfere, that's all you need to do. And you've gotten a hint of the next slide is this. It, it's like when you sit down to meditate, you have all these thoughts, comments, judgments, likes, just like all this stuff swirling around and with non-interference it eventually settles and when it settles to an extent there's a clarity as in the third model there's a clarity you can you can see through it there's there's the ability to have insight there so we want to adopt a posture in looking at this awareness and exploring this awareness of non-interference. And the second, the second thing is welcoming, which um, we can call benign indifference. So what does that mean? Remember I said in the beginning of the hour, we're not trying to get rid of anything. We're not trying to exclude everything. That kind of carries over here in, um, in the attitude of welcoming. And I can give you a couple analogies on that. One is the, uh, uh, one is the mirror. The mirror reflects everything that's put before it. It doesn't exclude, it has no likes or dislikes or preferences or doesn't exclude. The mirror doesn't say, oh, I'm gonna reflect the blue bottle because I like blue, but I'm not gonna reflect the pink bottle. It, it, in that sense, it, there's an equanimity of reflecting whatever comes before it. Another metaphor that I think is very helpful is that of the television screen. Let's call the screen the background, and when you turn on the TV, the story, the, the objects. Now, you see the screen when the TV's not on. But when the TV is on and you see the story, you don't notice the screen anymore. Now, does the screen care whether the show playing is of two lovers expressing their love for each other or bombs destroying a city? The screen, the screen is indifferent to the contents. Of the, of the screen or the picture being played. In a way, in this, in this welcoming is, we don't care that the story, the objects are trying to play. We don't care whether the story is good, bad. They're just, they're just objects. They're really of no interest. Where, in a way, grounding, where we're keeping our attention on the background, the screen, rather than the contents of the screen. So, we're going to do our next meditation to take a look at that, to explore, to explore that 
awareness. So again, sit in a comfortable position. Close your eyes. Sink in. And again, it doesn't matter whether there are thoughts or sensations or sense perceptions, whether your heart's racing, whether you're relaxed, whether you're not relaxed. The fact is whatever the condition of your body mind, there's always this awareness. How is it you know that you're agitated or relaxed? Who is it that knows? What is it that knows? The fact that we can express that and relay that means that something knows, that we know. And what is it that knows? What is it that is aware? So sink down and imagine you're the screen upon which all these objects are appearing. You're the sky upon which all these thoughts, sensations, perception are appearing, if, if there are any right now. Now first, if you have a thought, is there a place where the awareness of that thought is? Can you pinpoint a place where an awareness resides? Well, you may say, the thought may appear, well, of course it's the head, it's the brain, but in your own experience, can you locate a place where that awareness resides, where it's located? Now, if you have, if you, Notice a sound. And ask yourself the question. Is there a specific location where the awareness of that sound resides? And we can do the same for bodily sensation. And you may notice that there is no place in the conventional sense that we can pinpoint or look to and say that's where that awareness resides. And again, just shifting your focus a bit into the background, into the awareness. Is there a different awareness that knows a thought, that knows a bodily sensation, 
and that knows a sense perception. Do we have, are we comprised of three different awarenesses? Are, or are all three of those objects known by the same awareness? Just ask yourself that question and see what occurs, what comes, if anything. Next. Is the awareness bothered in any way by the nature of the object? If a thought is pleasant or unpleasant, a sound is loud or soft, a smell is pungent or subtle. Is the awareness of that sound or smell or thought affected in any way? Again, let yourself be that awareness. As if you had any choice. Is it possible to be other than that awareness? And now, can you find a border to your awareness? Is there a place where this awareness does not exist? Can you come up to a line, a boundary line, a fence, and see that on your side there's awareness and the other side is there not? Is there any limit? Again, look to your own direct experience. It's not an intellectual question. Can you find a place where this awareness doesn't exist. Does this awareness have a color? A shape? Does it have a form? Does this awareness have a particular religious persuasion?
does this awareness have a gender? That which is aware of your thoughts and sensations and sense perceptions. Does it have any characteristic at all? And we'll just take another moment or two, like another minute in silence, before we end this meditation. And when you're ready, slowly open your eyes. Um, I always seem to start this seminar by saying we'll do four or five segments and we end up doing three or four. So I hope the last segment, which ran about eight minutes or so, um, was okay uh, with you all. So now, um, if you all have uh, any questions, um, we'll address the questions. Let me see. Let me go on to the question and answers. There are no, there are no open questions. I know sometimes it's hard to transition from, in, in, and often there's a, a lot of non-thinking um, in, in meditation, uh, your left brain is kind of your intellectual sense is given a rest. So it's sometimes it's, um, um, you don't have an interest in formulating questions. So we will, let's see if any questions, no open questions now. Okay. We do have a, we do have a question from uh, Dennis. Do you recommend any other specific types of meditation with different focuses? Well, I'll answer that in two ways. One is often if you're drawn to something or you have a particular interest in something, it's good to, uh, it's good to explore that. So it's always good to follow your interest. Now, as far as different focuses, there are meditations that involve looking at a candle, reciting a mantra, a phrase, uh, a phrase um, uh, or listening to a sound or focusing on the breath. Those are all meditations in which the focus is on an object. I really wouldn't call them meditations per se, but exercises in concentration. So from my point of view, if you're going to spend the time doing this, you want to put your focus and attention on that which is of most value to you, your own authenticity, your own truth your awareness, your presence, whatever you want to, want to call that. To me, you want to focus your attention on what's of greatest value. And so for me, um, I find this of, 
of greatest, of greatest value and of greatest interest. But I don't want to minimize following um, your interests. It's really, uh, it's really important um, to acknowledge what you're interested in. Okay. Next question. What if I am from an anonymous attendee? What if I am involved in a conflict and authentically angry or feeling and, and authentically angry or in feeling the need to be adversarial? That is an opposition to the meditative state of mind. How do I square that authenticity with avoiding pretense? That's a really, really good, good question. And I'll give you two different examples about, um, well, let me do this before I answer this because some people may be leaving at one o'clock and let me just say a few closing technical things and I want to get back to your question because that's a very important question. My advice to you is to try meditating on a daily basis, even if it's for 10 minutes or so and just see what happens at the end of a month. I'm a, I'm a resource. You can call me, you can email me. Um, I'm happy to uh, answer questions. So look at, uh, look at me as a resource. Any feedback that you have about the webcast, about the meditation, um, please, um, we're happy to receive. We'd like this to be presented in a way that's in the most value. Um, uh, to everyone. If there's a group or organization that would like to invite me as a speaker, um, I'm happy to I'm happy to come. You can uh, contact me in that regard. The course in Florida is credited for up to three CLE credits, so we can do a two-hour or three-hour session. In Oregon, it's uh, credited for up to two hours. In California, it's not accredited. Um, if, uh, my California friends, if you have any suggestions how to crack the nut at the um, California bar, I'd appreciate it. I haven't had too much uh, success. Okay, now, the question that you asked is very important because most people, many people have the idea of being authentic, being in presence as the antithesis of of movement or action, or that um, that anger anger cannot or aggressiveness cannot coincide. And let me give you two examples. I had a trial, a criminal trial, and um, um, there were two assistant state attorneys. This is when I did criminal law in my first ten years. There were two assistant state attorneys uh, defending this case. It was a fight between my client and the police battery on a law enforcement officer resisting arrest with violence. This was a big deal. My client was going to jail if he was convicted. And during the course of the trial, as I was at the podium examining witnesses, talking to the judge, the assistant state attorneys were behind me playing with rubber bands and paper clips and fumbling and... I don't know, maybe they teach that at state attorney school to distract your opponent, but I, I just kept going. There was one point I was examining a witness and it just, they looked like, sounded like they were playing jacks back there. Uh, it got so much, I knew I had to respond. Now I could have said, I object your honor, they're being unprofessional, tell them to stop playing with their rubber bands. I could have done that. But spontaneously, what arose was this. I turned behind me and looked at them. I turned halfway and looked at the jury and had recognition from the jury and then turned and continued my examination. Now, I didn't pre-plan that in a way. It's just what I trusted. I would say that was an authentic response at my part, and it was very, it was very effective. You know, the jury looked at me, we looked at them, we, we, we bonded and said those two guys are being a bunch of jerks, but I didn't have to say anything to do that. Now, 
Another situation I had, this was in the Terry Schiavo case, the initial trial. I took the deposition of a witness, a young woman, two weeks before the trial. At the trial, she's called by the opposition, um, Terry Schiavo's parents. And she gets on the stand and she says the complete opposite of everything she said in her deposition two weeks ago. It was astounding. And obviously, sure, I can cross-examine, I can impeach. And again, what happened was I picked up her, the, when direct examination was done, I picked up her deposition and I slammed it on the table. Now, I'm, my style is I'm a pretty even going litigator. So if I shout, if I have a display like that, you know, the judge, his eyes go up, the jury says, hey man, some things must be, must be happening. But what that action was, it wasn't contrived. It was that offended my sense of justice. It offended, the, and when I say I, me, that part of us which lives in the truth, it offended that. And the expression of that offense was slamming that deposition on the table. So authenticity and residing in presence does not mean being passive. It means trusting yourself to do the right thing at the right time. Of course, all these responses are mediated by the fact and informed by the fact that I'm a trial attorney. I've been an attorney for 50 years. No, 40, uh, 45 years, let's call it. It informs on the fact that we have this practical training too, you know, uh, but you can be authentic and effective as an attorney and it doesn't mean being passive. Okay, next. An anonymous attendee. Similarly, what if my awareness is an awareness of the anger or need for action a particular conflict is causing. How do I put that on hold to meditate? Okay, that's, that's kind of a two-part question. I'll take the last part first. You don't put it on hold to meditate. You meditate, you sit down and meditate and Anger is a sensation in the body. It could be a burning sensation, the tense sensation, you feel hot. I mean, it, those are all bodily sensations and they can be combined with thoughts. Oh, my, you know, my friend called me a dummy or said I was dishonest or something like that. And so the thought can, the thought can provoke the bodily sensation, the bodily sensation can provoke the thought, it can be this, this running loop. But when you sit down, you, t you take your body-mind to meditate, you take it, you take it, as, it uh, as it is, so you don't have to put it on hold. Ultimately, ultimately, those are just the fireworks going off in the night sky. Those are the, you know, the bombs dropping in the war drama on the uh, on the TV. And the longer you meditate, the less distracting that you'll find those in a meditation practice. And the beauty of meditation is that this posture of meditation, this being aware of the background and the foreground at the same time, infiltrates into your daily life. So when something happens and somebody says, George, you're a dummy, and I have a reaction about it or something like that, or I don't have a reaction, it's just easier not to have those things affect you because in meditation, in that experiment of meditation, you realize that ultimately they have no effect on what you truly are, the awareness, the knowingness that, that you are. Okay, now next. Rather than reciting a, man, a mantra or chant or prayer, 
What about rocking back and forth? I'm in favor of rocking. <laughs> I ask my wife to rock me every now and then. It's very, it's very pleasing. It's very soothing. I don't mean to be facetious about your, your question. It's very, it's very relaxing. A lot of people I know do yoga or Tai Chi before they meditate because it dissipates uh, tension uh, beforehand. But ultimately, the rocking back and forth, if your eyes are closed, they're just bodily sensations. And so you can meditate while in movement. You can meditate in movement and rock back and forth. And what's interesting is, if you do that for a while, you may get the sense that the sensations are moving, but you are not. That that which is aware of the bodily sensation of rocking back and forth is not moving uh, itself. Do you use any um, background music? Um, that's, that's a matter of, of preference, I suppose. The, um, again, your meditation practice is a kind of a controlled experience where you minimize distractions to make it um, um, easier to, um, uh, to meditate. For me personally, I find background music kind of distracting a little bit. Other people may find it very, um, uh, very relaxing, but it's just, an, it's just another object. Again, the background music is the sense perception. Do you want to have a sense perception um, going on throughout your meditation? If that works for you, that's, that's fine. For me personally, um, I prefer um, not having uh, background music. Um, Hi, George. Not... We have one uh, question in the chat box here. Oh, okay. In the chat box. Um, I can read it out for you if you like. Sure. Okay, it's from David, and he says, I have been expressing a lot of anxiety, especially in the morning. Do you have any recommendations on how to deal with them? Thank you in advance. So, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by expressing anxiety. Um, expressing kind of to me means acting out, speaking about, um, I'm not sure if, David, if you can clarify what you mean by expressing anxiety in the chat box, that would be very helpful. And then in the meantime, we have one more question in the Q&A, and then I'll go back to uh, uh, David's question. Anonymous attendee asks, in Jewish temples, that is, that is divining during prayer. And it's spelled D-A-V-I-N-I-N-G. I don't know what that, I'm sorry, I really can't comment on that or answer that because I don't know, I'm not sure if this is a question and I don't know what that is, what that is divining. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, if you'd like to rephrase it, I'd be happy to give it a, a try. But I'm in the not. in the chat box here, um, someone's pointing out that it, that term is in response to the participant who asked about rocking back and forth. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Now, um, let's see. Let's see if we have, okay. okay. Getting back to David's question about having a lot of anxiety. Um, I'll just mention a number of things practically for me in terms of anxiety, worry, um, stress. On the practical level is 
am I doing things that are, um, can dissipate those at least in a, in a physical sense. For me, um, I try to swim half a mile a day, at least a few times a week. I play tennis. Exercise for me is, as my wife reminds me, <laughs> is very, is very mood enhancing, uh, is very mood enhancing for me. Um, eating right, sleeping right, all those, all those practical things are um, important. And, and let's make a distinction. They're important for the body-mind mechanism, and the body-mind organism. Because ultimately, when you say, I have been having a lot of anxiety, the question is, who do you mean by I? As we saw in our meditation, the awareness which is at your center is not perturbed, is not bothered by any of the objects that appear in it. So your awareness, that authentic, present source part of yourself, whatever we want to call it, has no anxiety, is not anxious. And so it's helpful to remember that at your root, at your core, there is no anxiety. Now, are there disturbing thoughts, sensations, problems on the relative level, on the body-mind level? Yes. There are. Just strictly talking from a med meditation point of view, um, aside from the practicalities of doing the best for your body, eating, exercising, being in the right profession, I mean, some people, some people do better doing other types of work, the right, right livelihood, I'm not suggesting change your work or anything, but those are all practical factors. But as far as meditation is concerned, the more you are able to know the part of you that is never anxious, the, I think the, the more that that can inform um, the other parts, the other parts of your, of your life. So that would be my suggestion. I, um, um, you know, without knowing more about it, it's, it's kind of hard, um, it's kind of hard to say. And believe me, I can, I can relate to you. I mean, in the, in the Terry Schiavo case, I, I had to, I had to leave my house because of death threats a number of times. I was looking for many days under my car to see if there were explosive devices. Um, you know, we all, we all have very, very challenging situations in, uh, in life. No one, no one is exempt. And, um, you know, this is just, this is a tool among many that I hope can help you uh, in that regard. So there are no questions left in the Q&A. Um, Will, were there any questions left in, um, in chat that maybe came up in chat? Uh, I'm not seeing any more questions. There's a bit of a discussion about um, the rocking back and forth. Uh, do you want to take a look at that? You can open the chat panel there. Oh, okay, okay, let me just... Okay, so somebody mentioned when you, when you say anxiety does not exist in your core being, do you mean it doesn't exist in your meditative core being or in your core because anxiety is metabolic? I would consider that to be in your core. Well, I think that, I think that is, um, we're probably getting into semantics here because when you try to describe that which doesn't change, that which does that which is real, which we've called awareness. There is a 
difficulty, the best we can do is point to it because that awareness is not an object. And because it has an object, it has no objective characteristics. Um, if we're talking the core of our, uh, our body in, in terms of our metabolic activity, you know, that's something very different than what we're pointing to or looking towards um, today. But of course, I agree, anxiety is in, in great part uh, metabolic. That, and as body-mind organisms, you know, we're subject to, we're subject to that. You know, I just wanted to spell something that a lot of people say, well, if I meditate, if I, I and when I meditate, I, I, I experience times of, great peace and happiness or transcendent joy or something like that. I wish I felt that way all the time. Well, we're never going to feel anything all the time because feeling is transient and the body-mind organism is transient. Um, so, um, you know, you can be the best meditator in the world. I don't care if you're somebody's an enlightened, uh, enlightened being. Um, you know, the the, the body-mind organism, the metabolism, um, uh, has its own natural uh, limitations that we are that we're subject to, and hopefully, kind of enjoy along the way. So, thank you. Thank you all very much. It's been a real privilege for me to share uh, this time, uh, this time with you. And so we will call it, um, we will call it a day and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you again.